This week we'll be studying Chapter 8, DNA Structure and Function. I really enjoyed the story at the beginning of Chapter 8, the story about the dog tracker who helped find survivors at Ground Zero from the September 11th attacks in 2001. And as a search dog going through all that rubble. Uh, he was exposed to a lot of chemicals and died in 2009, probably some from some after effects of that. His owner, shortly thereafter, applied to um, what I didn't know about before, but uh, the Golden Clone giveaway, where uh, they were looking for the most clone-worthy dog, and his owner applied and won and so Tracker the dog's DNA was shipped to Korea and they actually cloned five puppies from Tracker and then shipped them back to Tracker's owner. They also talk about uh, some of the benefits of cloning and yet some of the difficulties that we have. Adult DNA in cells that are already mature acts differently than DNA that is in the cells of a developing embryo. And so if we're going to get a handle on cloning, we need to learn how to control that. And they have partially uh, with a long ways to go yet, but some of the benefits of growing tissues and organs that someone might need or saving endangered animals, extinct animals, um, cloning livestock, pets, and such, livestock for food, could be some possible solutions to problems that our culture faces. But obviously a lot of conversations would have to happen on what is actually acceptable. But it was an interesting story. A clone is a genetically identical copy of an organism, and a lot of cloning of uh, livestock and pets is already happening and uh, may one day be something that is just a normal part of society but right now we have a lot to learn all organisms pass their DNA to offspring when they reproduce Using this genetic material is one of the characteristics that all life on Earth share. This ability to pass your DNA, your instructions to your offspring. In our cells, each DNA molecule is organized as a chromosome. So a chromosome is basically some proteins with spools of DNA wrapped tightly around them and in different organisms there's different numbers of chromosomes in humans there's 23 pair or 46 and so we could say that those 46 chromosomes that we have as humans carry all of our cells genetic information during most of a cell's life each of its chromosome consists of one DNA molecule as it prepares to divide, the cell duplicates its chromosomes so that both offspring gets a full set. That process is called mitosis and will be um, one of the concepts that we'll talk about in a different lecture at a different time. After chromosomes are duplicated, each consists of two DNA molecules, which are called sister chromatids, that are attacked attached to each other at what's called a centromere. And here's the definitions of those things. A sister chromatid is one of two attached members of a duplicated eukaryotic chromosome. Remember a eukaryotic cell is one that has a nucleus. A centromere is a constricted region in a eukaryotic chromosome where sister chromatids are attached. And I've pulled up a picture here so you can get a look at uh, what that looks like. Uh, right here in the middle that would be considered the centromere 
and each one of these, one is circled, is a duplicated chromosome of each other. These are copies of each other. So the circled one here is called one sister chromatid and is a copy to the other chromatid. If you look really closely, you can really see how tightly wound the DNA is. They say that there's about two meters worth of DNA in each cell, and it makes you wonder, how can you get two meters of something so, um, into something, two meters of something into something so small, like a cell nucleus? And Mother Nature's answer to that is to wind it really, really tight. And so by winding DNA oh so tight around these proteins, which are called histones, we make these condensed bodies called chromosomes that we can actually visualize under a microscope. Usually, uh, if we want to visualize them better, we'll stain a cell that's undergoing cell division or mitosis, and then we're able to see these things much better. And I'll have some pictures of those coming up. Chromosome structure, DNA in a nucleus is divided into chromosomes. As I said before, humans have 46, 23 pair. Remember you get of those 23 pair, one from mom and one from your dad. At its most condensed, a duplicated chromosome is packed tightly into an X shape. That goes back to this picture here. It kind of looks like an X. Remember this is actually a duplicated chromosome here. A chromosome unravels as a single, single fiber, a hollow cylinder formed by coiled coils. The coiled coils consist of a long molecule of DNA and its associated proteins. Those proteins are called histone proteins, forming beads called nucleosomes. The DNA molecule has two strands twisted into a double helix, and I'll have some pictures of that coming up later as well. Here's a picture though of DNA, which is the strands here, being tightly wound around the histone proteins. And together with the DNA around its histone proteins, you make what's called the nucleosome. Condense all that together, wrap it really tight, and you get the chromosome. So remember right here in the middle of this chromosome, that's where the centromere is. And each one of these is a sister chromatid, which is, uh, is a duplicate of each other. Eukaryotic DNA is divided among a number of chromosomes that differ in length and shape. The sum of all your chromosomes is the chromosome number. And diploid cells have two of each type. Like I said, we have 23 pair because our mother furnishes 23 and our father furnishes 23. So as humans, we are diploid organisms. If you had just one of each chromosome, you would be called haploid, H-A-P-L-O-I-D. Our sperm and egg are actually haploid because remember, when we pass our DNA to our offspring, we only pass half. We don't get to pass all of our chromosomes, just one of each pair to our offspring. So our regular mature cells in our body are diploid, and our sperm and egg are haploid. This is called the karyotype. This is that picture of someone's chromosomes that were ready to undergo mitosis or cell division. At that time, the cell was stained, and each of these chromosomes then pick up the stain really nice, and they make this ba banding pattern. Each of our chromosome pairs then picks up the stain similarly so that you can actually pick out the two number ones. Remember that uh, of the two number ones, one of these was from mother and one was from father. And you can see how they're about the same size and have the same banding pattern. Chromosome pair two, you'll notice they get smaller as you go down the list. Scientists are, are mapping what genes are on each of these chromosomes. They've figured out quite a bit, but not everything. 
and they get smaller as we go down and here uh, going down to number 21 and 22 are our smallest chromosomes and then finally you can see this is a female because it has two X chromosomes you can see how these two chromosomes here are the X chromosomes match their banding patterns and size so when the mother furnishes an X chromosome which is always the case and then the father furnishes an X, you have a little baby girl. Besides uh, gender, the X chromosome also has many, many other genes on there. This one is missing a Y, which is the case when you have a girl. Here's a karyotype of a boy. Still has the number one, the number two, all the way down to the number 22, which again is the smallest. But instead of having two X's, there's one X, and then its mismatched partner, which is much, much smaller, the Y chromosome. There's actually only about 30 genes or so on the Y chromosome. One of the most important genes on the Y chromosome is called the SRY gene, and it kicks in during development, causing the embryo to, the cells to release uh, testosterone which then creates the uh, physical features of a boy. Again the chromosome number is the sum of all chromosomes in a cell of a given type. Humans have 46 or 23 pair. Diploid means that you are 2N. RN would mean 23 and then we have double that, so 2 times 23 would be our 46. Humans have 46 chromosomes. Our body cells have two of each type. So our diploid is 2N or 2 times 23, which is 46. Each pair of chromosomes, again, has two versions, a maternal and a paternal. Members of a pair of sex chromosomes differ among males and females. All of the other chromosomes, 1 through 22, are called autosomes, but the X and the Y are called the sex chromosomes. The two Xs have the same length, the shape, centromere location, and carry the same genes, um, but the X and the Y, like I said before, are a mismatched pair they actually do not carry the same genes. Again, a sex chromosome are the X and the Y. Males then are said to be XY, females XX. Autosomes are all the rest of the chromosomes, pairs 1 through 22. Remember for each of those you get one from your mom and one from your dad and they have the same genes on on them, though there may be different versions for instance, the gene for blood type, you may get an A from your mother and an O from your father, meaning you then would have type A blood because A is dominant over O. And that's one of the many examples. Again, the karyotype is the picture of your chromosomes. Many people who are pregnant sometimes decide to get karyotypes done by taking cells from the amniotic fluid around the baby or from other regions and you can take some of those cells, stain them, make a karyotype and see if they have the correct number. In a human karyotype that's normal there should be 22 pairs of autosomes and two X chromosomes if it's a girl and then of course an X and a Y if it's a boy. Body cells of human females contain two X's and the males contain the X and Y. New individuals, ra individuals randomly inherit one sex chromosome from the mother which is the X and then from the father the sperm can carry either the X or the Y so it's a 50-50 chance. If an X-bearing sperm fertilizes an X-bearing 
egg, the result is a female. Vice versa, if the sperm carries a Y, then it's going to develop into a male, of course, if all the genes work properly. Some key concepts, chromosomes, the DNA of a eukaryotic cell is divided among a characteristic number of chromosomes that differ in length and shape. Sex chromosomes determine an individual's gender. Proteins associated with eukaryotic DNA help organize chromosomes so that they can pack into a nucleus nice and tightly. For a long time, people wondered what actually was the genetic material. They knew some of the different materials that were within cells, such as proteins and lipids and nucleic acids, such as DNA. Uh, but a lot of experiments were done in order to help prove that it actually was the DNA that was carrying our genetic code and the instructions to make an organism. Almost 100 years of experiments with bacteria and bacteriophage, which is a virus that infects bacteria, shown here in the picture, offer solid evidence that deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, not the proteins and not the other substances in the cell, is indeed the hereditary material of life. In the picture below, these are some bacteriophages that are injecting their, in, their genetic material into a bacteria. In the late 1800s, Johannes Miescher found that, nucleic, or that nuclei contained an acidic substance composed mostly of nitrogen and phosphorus. Later, that substance would be called deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. In the early 1900s, Frederick Griffith used two strains of Streptococcus pneumoniae, or also called strep bacteria, in a series of experiments that revealed a clue about the inheritance. In Griffith's experiments, he isolated two strains of strep bacteria, strep bacteria that causes pneumonia, um, a harmless and then a, a harmless rough and that we call that the R strain and then a killer smooth, the S strain. So try to keep those straight in the next notes. The R is the harmless and the S is the killer strain. The hereditary material of the harmful strep cells was transformed from dead S cells into live R cells, tra transforming harmless R cells into killer S. And that transformation was permanent and heritable. So here's a little bit more about that. So the mice were injected with live cells of the harmless R strain, and usually those did not die because, of course, those are the harmless strain. Mice were injected with the live cells of the S strain, which, remember, are the harmless ones, and uh, that would cause the mice to die. Then, to kind of prove a point here, mice were injected with heat-killed S cells. Those did not die um, because the heat would kill those bacteria, so they wouldn't be able to infect the mice, therefore they did not die. And in another experiment, mice were injected with the live R cells, remember those are the harmless ones, plus the heat killed S cells, and the mice would die. So what was happening here was that there must have been a substance that was passed from the dead, harmful bacteria to the live, harmless bacteria, which changed their phenotype or their physical characteristics. This process is widely known today as transformation, and it turns out that bacteria are able to share their genetics, to share their DNA. 
So you could have some perfectly harmless bacteria come in contact with harmful bacteria and if the harmful bacteria share their DNA with the harmless ones, they now become harmful as well. Again, that's transformation. Even in heat-killed bacteria, this can still happen. Some more clues. Again, remember our goal here is to figure out what is the genetic material. In the 1940s, Oswald Avery and Macklin McCarty tried to identify Griffith's transforming principle. Um, again, they wanted to find out, is it the lipids doing this? Is it the proteins or the nucleic acids, which is what DNA is made out of? The S cell extract still transformed our cells after treatment with lipid and protein destroying enzymes. So transforming principle must be, must be nucleic acid, which is RNA or DNA. S cell extract still transformed our cells after treatment with the RNA degrading enzymes, but not after treatment with DNA degrading enzymes. So the DNA had to be the transforming principle. So basically in this experiment, when the DNA was destroyed by enzymes, transformation could no longer happen. DNA is indeed the transforming principle. And here's a little bit more on their experiment. When they injected protein into the bacteria, there was no effect. But indeed, the, when the DNA was injected, it transformed the harmless bacteria into the virulent or pathogenic bacteria. So the, what's the conclusion? It's definitely the DNA. There's a picture of Avery, McCarty, and McLeod. Their conclusion, the first experimental, experimental evidence that DNA was indeed the genetic material. Still trying to confirm DNA's function, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase tested whether genetic material injected by bacteriophages into bacteria is indeed DNA, or is it protein, or is it both? Remember, bacteriophages are viruses that attack bacteria. So, based on the fact that proteins contain more sulfur than phosphorus, and DNA contains more phosphorus than sulfur, um, they were able to find that the virus that infects the bacteria was indeed injecting its DNA in, and that's what was causing the transformation. They grew their phage viruses in two types of media, with radioactively labeled either sulfur or phosphorus. Remember, the sulfur is in the proteins and the phosphorus is in the DNA. Here's a picture again of the bacteriophages here. Bacteriophages work by inserting their own genetic material into the bacteria. In their first experiment, Bacteria were infected with virus particles that had proteins labeled with the sulfur. Viruses were dislodged from the bacteria by whirling the mixture in a kitchen blender. Most radioactive sulfur was detected in the viruses, not in the bacterial cells. So the viruses must not have injected protein into the bacteria. So this was a fancy way to mark where the protein was located by marking the sulfur in the protein. So they were seeing that um, the viruses were not injecting protein into the bacteria. In their second experiment, the bacteria were infected with virus particles that had DNA labeled with the radioact radioisotope of phosphorus. Because remember, DNA has a lot of phosphorus. 
when the viruses were dislodged from the bacteria, radioactive phosphorus was detected inside the bacterial cells. So the viruses indeed had injected DNA into the cells. This is evidence that DNA is indeed the genetic material of this virus. And here's a picture of what's going on here. So the protein coat here had the radioactively labeled sulfur. The DNA of the virus had the radioactively labeled phosphorus. And in the end, the radioactively labeled phosphorus was inside the bacteria injected there by the virus because phosphorus is a component of DNA. So DNA is the molecule that carries the viral genetic info. And again, this was by Hershey and Chase. And here is a picture of this with the uh, kitchen blender. And a little bit more on the same stuff. The sulfur, again, which is in proteins, um, did not enter the bacteria, but the, ph the phosphorus did. DNA is the transforming factor. There's Martha Chase and Alfred Hershey right there. So, the discovery of DNA's function. The work of many scientists over more than a century led to the discovery that DNA is the molecule that stores hereditary information. James Watson and Francis Crick's discovery of DNA structure was based on many years of research by other scientists. So now that we know it's DNA, what does this stuff actually look like? What's its structure? So, we know DNA's um, building blocks. DNA nucleotide has a five carbon sugar, three phosphate groups, and one of four nitrogen containing bases. And uh, that would include adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. Instead of writing all those words out, often we just say A, G, T's, and C's. They're arranged in DNA and it was about a 50-year puzzle to solve. Each nucleotide has three phosphate groups, again a deoxyribose sugar, and a nitrogen-containing base, after which it's named. Um, this was identified in the early 1900s. In the 1950s, Erwin Shargriff made two discoveries and some rules with concerning DNA. That um, the amounts of adenine in DNA about equals the amount of thymine. And the amount of guanine in DNA about equals the amount of cytosine. So the second rule, proportions of adenine and guanine would then differ among DNA of different species. Here's the actual percentages here. So you should notice the A's and T's are about the same and the G's and C's are about the same. This varies from species to species. All four bases are not in equal quantity. But we'll always find this ratio that A's are about the same as T and G's about the same as C. American biologist James Watson and British biophysicist Francis Crick suspected that the DNA molecule was a helix. They argued about the size, the shape, and the bonding requirements of the four DNA nucleotides. Here is Watson and Crick here. This is their famous picture when their eureka moment came and they built their working molecule of DNA as a double helix. 
biochemist Rosalind Franklin had also been working on the structure of DNA using a process called X-ray crystallography to calculate the size, shape, and spacing between any repeating elements of the molecules. And she made the first clear X-ray diffraction image of wet DNA, the form that occurs in cells. There's her picture. Here's her picture of the X-ray diffraction of DNA. If you put some mathematical um, models to this, you come up with this above it. The structure of DNA, there's a, a three prime carbon of a sugar, which is joined by a phosphate group to the five prime carbon of the next sugar, forming two sugar phosphate backbones running in opposite directions. And then inside are the paired bases of A to T and G to C. And I have a picture of that in the next slide. Here it is here. So we see our, our A's with T's. A's and T's always bond together. So this is a molecule of adenine, which then joins to the molecule of sugar deoxyribose, which then that joins to the phosphate group. When we have molecules of sugar, we actually number their carbons. At each of the corners here is a carbon, except for right here where there's an oxygen. And so this is the third sugar up here, or excuse me, the third carbon. So that's why we call this the three prime end. And down here, this is the five prime end because the fifth carbon is up over here. Over here we have our thymine, again connected to the sugar deoxyribose and then which is then connected to the phosphate group. And you'll notice this side is flipped from the other side. So that's why this is the five prime end because this is the fifth carbon in this sugar. And down here, this is the three prime end because of the, th the, sh the, sh the excuse me, the third carbon right there. So in DNA, one side runs 3 prime to 5 prime, and on the other side, 5 prime to 3 prime. In between the bases, we have weak hydrogen bonds, which is actually a good thing because these bonds actually have to be broken whenever we want to make copies of DNA and make sister chromatids. Together in adenine with its sugar, and with its phosphate group makes one nucleotide. And again, they come in four different types, an adenine nucleotide, here's a cytosine nucleotide, a guanine nucleotide, and a thymine nucleotide. Because adenines always hydrogen bond with thymines, you'll always have about the same amount of adenine as thymine in a DNA molecule. And the same goes for cytosine and guanine. They like to have three hydrogen bonds between them. And so they always bond together. So in a DNA molecule, you'll have about the same amount of cytosine as you do guanine. And over here is a picture of that double helix. One turn is about 3.4 nanometers, which is about 10 to the negative ninth. It's a very, very small unit. The order of which the base follows each other uh, varies among species. That's Chargraff's second rule. And the variations in the base sequence are the source of life's diversity. If there weren't variations in the sequence of the order of these A, C, T's, and G's, um, we would all be clones of each other. But since the order is different, we have variation. The order of the ATCs and Gs is called your genome or your genetic code. 
Again, a DNA molecule consists of two long chains of nucleotides coiled into a double helix. Four kinds exist, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine nucleotides. And the order of these varies among individuals and among species. Among clones, they're about the same. As well as identical twins, I should say, too. Watson and Crick reviewed Franklin's X-ray diffraction image with another crystallographer who Franklin was working under, Maurice Wilkins, and they used her unpublished data to build their DNA mo or model. In 1962, Watson, Crick, and Wilkins received the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the structure of DNA. Franklin didn't get the Nobel Prize, be though the picture was hers, um, because she died at the age of 37 of ovarian cancer, probably connected to all of the x-ray exposure that uh, she had been subjected to from her job. There's some controversy uh, surrounding all of this, whether Watson and Crick and Wilkins really did have the rights to her work um, without her knowing. The order of the nucleotide bases in a strand of DNA is the DNA sequence. Descendant cells must get an exact copy of DNA. And when DNA replicates itself, it's called DNA replication or DNA duplication. When DNA is copied, enzymes break apart those hydrogen bonds that I mentioned before and separates the two strands. I like this picture down here. So here we have DNA together. Here we have the parts separated. Then new nucleotides fill in, always bonding A's with T's and C's with G's. And in the end, we have two molecules of DNA where once we only had one. And they should be exact copies of each other. This is called semi-conservative replication because in each strand you have part of its old and part of its new. So now that we have two strands, this cell would be able to divide this strand going one way and this strand going the other. Each cell, what we call each daughter cell, getting an exact copy. Again, the DNA sequence is the order of nucleotide bases in a strand of DNA. DNA replication is the process by which a cell duplicates its DNA before cell division. The steps of DNA replication. Again, the two strands of DNA are complementary. The nucleotides match up. G's with C's, T's with A's. DNA helicase is the name of that enzyme that breaks those hydrogen bonds between the two strands. And then the two DNA strands can unwind. Each parent strand then serves as a template for assembly of a new DNA strand to form from nucleotides according to, of course, the base pairing rules, A's with T, C's with D's. DNA polymerase is the name of the enzyme that adds the new nucleotides. And DNA ligase is the name of the enzyme that seals any gaps that remain between bases of the new DNA so that a continuous strand forms. Again, it's called semi-conservative replication. Again, because in the new strand, part of it's actually old, called the parent strand, oops, and part of it is actually new, the daughter strand. Each DNA strand has an unbonded five prime carbon at one end and an unbonded three prime carbon at the other. DNA synthesis occurs in the, fi in the five prime to the three prime direction. Remember, the 5 prime and the 3 prime are because we number the carbons in the sugar. 
only um, one of the new DNA strands can be assembled in a single piece continuously. The other one has to be done in short little segments because it, it runs uh, the wrong way for the way these enzymes work. So they do it in, in pieces and it takes a little bit longer to do it than the other strands. So it's called the lagging strand. And the little strands that it does at a time are called Okazaki fragments named after the scientist that discovered them. Here's a picture of that. A little primer is laid down and then the other pieces are assembled in. Here's our enzyme here working. Other enzymes working. All so that we can fill in our two sides. Here's a picture of what that looks like in both the continuous strand above and the uh, lagging strand here. Again, just because of the direction pieces are put in at a time. So that's called the lagging strand. It just takes a little bit longer. A DNA molecule is not always replicated perfectly, but luckily there's enzymes. There's actually um, quite a few of these d DNA polymerase enzymes that proofread their own work they have a DNA repair mechanism that corrects any mismatches so that we always get our A's with T's and our C's with G's. When proofreading and repair mechanisms fail, which does sometimes happen, you have an error called a mutation. And then that would be a permanent change in the sequence of the DNA. Um, they can be good, they can be bad, and they can be neutral. Again, before a cell divides, it copies its DNA so that each of the descendants gets a full complement of hereditary information. After all, those are the instructions for the cell. Newly forming DNA is monitored for errors, most of which are corrected. Uncorrected errors can be perpetuated as mutations. Those can be good, and they can be bad, and they can be neutral. evolution and natural selection can act on those mutations. Um, they may help an organism survive better and therefore reproduce better or they can um, be lethal, cause the organism to die and never reach reproductive age. Or again they can be neutral and have no effect on the organism. Various technologies are involved in cloning. Reproductive cloning are technologies that produce genetically identical individuals, aka clones. Somatic cell nuclear transfer, or SCNT, fuses an adult cell with an enucleated egg. That means you get a nice big juicy egg and you take the nucleus out of it and you put in the uh, nucleus of a cell that you want into this empty egg. Therapeutic cloning produces embryos that are used for stem cell research. Cloning can refer to a laboratory method by which researchers copy DNA fragments. It can also refer to interventions in reproduction that result in an exact genetic copy of an organism. Reproductive cloning, which is artificial twinning, and any other technology that yields genetically identical individuals. To clone an adult, scientists must transform one of its differentiated cells into an undifferentiated cell by turning its unused DNA back on. Somatic cell nuclear transfer is the method of reproductive cloning in which a researcher removes the nucleus from an unfertilized egg and then inserts it into the egg uh, nucleus, or inserts into the egg a nucleus from an adult body cell, as I mentioned before. 
With therapeutic cloning, researchers are already using SCNT to produce human embryos for research, which is a practice called therapeutic cloning. The researchers harvest undifferentiated or stem cells from the cloned human embryos. Those are, or these terms here, refer to DNA or cells that um, have all of their DNA turned on. Therapeutic cloning, the use of SCNT to produce human embryos for research purposes. Several methods are now commonly used to produce clones of adult animals for research and agriculture practices. The techniques are far from perfect, and the practice continues, of course, to raise serious ethical questions. There's some problems in cloning. The first clone mammal in the 1990s um, that really hit the news was Dolly the sheep. Um, she started having old age problems when she was only two. If I remember right, uh, she lived to age seven, whereas the real type of sheep that she was usually lived to age 14. Clones can sometimes be overweight or have enlarged organs or just be overly too big. Clone mice develop lung and liver problems and almost all die prematurely. And clone pigs tend to limp and have heart problems. Um, one never did develop a tail or even worse, an anus. So, uh, there's a lot of things that need to be figured out with cloning of organisms. That concludes our chapter 8. Again, please remember to read the chapter and study it, as well as the notes and the videos. And, of course, always do the questions in the back of the chapter, the self-quiz and, of course, the data analysis and critical thinking activities.